One key issue that had been considered a problem for the conventional Big Bang theory that inflation solves is something called the flatness problem. The question of why the universe is so close to being flat in the sense of Euclidean, especially at very, very early times, because the universe had to have been incredibly close to flat at early times to be even reasonably close to flat today. That's just the way the evolution, according to general relativity, uh, works. Uh, so one way of phrasing this flatness problem is that at about one second after what we call the Big Bang, the universe had to have a relationship between its mass density and its expansion rate, which held to 15 decimal places, which means that if you tell me what expansion rate you're talking about, I can tell you what the density is to 15 decimal places. And that's rather extraordinary. And the conventional Big Bang theory required this precise equality to get to where we, where we are today. Uh, but there was nothing in the conventional Big Bang theory to explain how we got to that situation. So it seemed like a tremendous mystery, uh, but inflation solves it. Inflation drives the mass density of the universe to just the right value that this condition requires. Another key problem is what is called the horizon problem, which is related to the fact that in conventional cosmology, the early universe expands so quickly that the different pieces of it have no time to communicate in any way with each other, even at the speed of light. They really are what is called in physics causally disconnected uh, in the context of the conventional Big Bang model. Uh, yet nonetheless, when we look out at the cosmic background radiation, uh, we see that it's uniform in temperature in all directions uh, to an accuracy of about one part in 100,000, incredible uniformity. Uh, but in the conventional Big Bang theory, the photons coming from that way had no way of knowing anything about the photons coming from the other way. Inflation solves that by starting with the universe being much, much smaller than it would have been in conventional cosmology. Uh, the uniformity can be established before inflation sets in. And then inflation takes a tiny speck, which has already been made uniform, and stretches it to become large enough to include everything that we observe, thereby giving a very natural explanation for the uniformity that we do observe in the universe. Number three, uh, structure. Our picture of how structure forms in the universe which I think really does follow pretty much directly from observation, is that the early universe was incredibly smooth. We see this in the cosmic microwave background, smooth to about one part 100,000. But it's gravitationally unstable. Places where there's a slight excess of mass create a slightly stronger than average gravitational field, uh, pulling in more mass, creating a still stronger inhomogeneity. Uh, and this process is nonlinear and unstable, and it ultimately causes matter to collapse uh, into stars, galaxies, clusters of galaxies. But the origin of these initial fluctuations had always been mysterious. Uh, we knew they had to be there because structure would not have formed without them. But nobody had any theory of where, this, where these initial non-uniformities at the level of one part in 100,000 might have come from. Inflation, it turns out, offers a very simple explanation for that, a rather mind-boggling explanation, though, uh, I would say, uh, which is that it's all due to quantum physics. At the classical level, inflation would have simply smoothed everything out by stretching it. You stretch a rubber band and it becomes tauter and tauter and straighter and straighter. But at the quantum level, it can't become completely smooth. That violates uh, uncertainty principles that the quantum theory has built into it. Uh, so where the classical theory would be predicting a completely uniform universe, the quantum version of that theory says that it's almost completely uniform, but in some places it's slightly more mass massive than others, slightly higher mass density than in other places. Some places the mass density is slightly lower than the average. And that's exactly what the early universe looked like. And the theory even predicts uh, what we call the spectrum of these inhomogeneities, which is the way in which the strength of the non-uniformities depends on what wavelength you're looking at. Uh, there are non-uniformities of very short wavelengths, there's non-uniformities of very large wavelengths, and inflation predicts exactly what the relative intensities of those uh, should be for, for all possible wavelengths. Uh, and when we were first calculating these things, which is around 1982, it seemed to me like it was totally fantastical that anybody would ever 
conceivably measure these things. But the technology developed fantastically, and now we have amazingly precise measurements of the non-uniformities of the cosmic microwave background radiation, uh, which show this spectrum that I'm talking about. Uh, and the fit between what we see and what was predicted is really just marvelous. So I think most of us now regard that as a very significant uh, success uh, of the inflationary picture. Well, I think the main trouble that I've always had, inflation or no inflation really, is this issue about the difference between the generic singularities which come about from gravitational collapse and what we seem to see in the early universe in, in the Big Bang or the result of inflation, if that's what it is. And the view I have is that there's something else going on. You see, I have a certain uh, wild idea, which I think may well be true, and most standard cosmologists don't believe me. But there are bits of evidence we're beginning to see which do suggest that maybe there is some truth in this model, which says that the Big Bang was not really the beginning. Mm -hmm. It was the conformal continuation. Mm -hmm. but what I'm trying to say is in the Big Bang, because the energies are so big and the particles become effectively massless, they can't tell big from small. Mm -hmm. So at that stage, there's the kind of geometry doesn't know big from small is important. The other place when it, you can't tell big from small is an extremely remote future, where the universe expands and expands exponentially, and you mostly photons running around, and they don't know big from small. And you've got the black holes, and then they eventually evaporate away by Hawking evaporation, mm -hmm. and then you've got nothing left. So the crazy idea is that this very remote future joins on to the Big Bang, of a next eon. Mm -hmm. And our Big Bang was the conformally squashed remote future of a previous eon. When you look at the early universe and where the cosmic microwave background was created, you go back and back in time until you get, well, it's 380,000 years after the Big Bang, but it's pretty early, and you see this uh, radiation. And it's not only very uniform over the whole sky, but it has this beautiful Planck spectrum, which tells you that you are looking at maximum entropy. So you're looking at completely random. As far as the radiation and matter is concerned, it's utterly random. Now, you see, the second law of thermodynamics tells you entropy goes up and up in time. And this is really very puzzling because you go back and back in time, so it should the entropy should be going down and down and down until you see a maximum. You have to look to see where the entropy goes in the evolution of the universe. It goes into black holes. Absolutely, the, the Bekenstein-Hawking formula for the entropy in a black hole utterly dominates everything else. You don't have to get a very big black hole before that happens. In the black holes that we well, see, of course, is perhaps a little bit an um, inappropriate term, but we infer that black holes are there and they, some of them are really huge. And you don't have to take many of them, probably even one, one of the hugest one would, would encompass the, mo most of the entropy in any other form that we see in the universe. So it absolutely dominates everything. That's where the entropy goes, into the black holes. Well, what happens to the black holes? Well, according to Stephen Hawking, they eventually evaporate away. And then either a lot of the entropy may go into the radiation, some of it may get lost in singularities, in, in the singularity in the black hole. It depends on your point of view. Some people think it can't get lost in singularities. Other people like me <laughs> think a lot of it does get lost in the singularity. It doesn't actually make much difference from the observational point of view. Now, I, I should backtrack a little bit because the entropy is certainly a driving force behind the theory. And therefore, we have to ask why the singularities that you get in black holes do not, are, quite so, are so different from the Big Bang. I mean, the kind of argument that Alan was putting forward, that's a different way of looking at the whole problem. In fact, I was impressed by the list of things he mentioned at the beginning, and I think CCC has to address all those questions just as well as inflation does. And I should, would say also, it's not just maybe in CCC explains some and inflation sense the other, they are incompatible. If you have an inflationary phase that would wipe out all the signals 
which would confirm CCC. So you're really looking at Planck scale dynamics on the other side. And so there's no reason to say that the information is preserved that you've gone from the, on the other side. It's more or less just the mass that comes through. The only thing that, that, any, that you can say from the theory uh, with any confidence is that the total mass in that black hole will come through and have an effect on the other side. But the details of that will be completely swallowed up in, in, in smaller than Planck scale dynamics. All the radiation, all the information in that black hole is squeezed into a little point. On the other side, it's just a burst of energy. What the form that energy is, maybe in future observations, one will have some clues to what form it has. But, but it would simply be one burst of energy in that point. And this will be propagated. Photons can't get out because, because the density is much too great. And they don't finally get out until you get 380,000 years when the microwave background is, is formed. It's just there's an in, in injection of a, of a large amount of matter, a large amount of mass energy, if you like. And that mass energy um, spreads out with the speed of light. Eternal inflation is somewhat more speculative than inflation itself. Uh, my understanding of the sociology of the field is that there are a huge number of people who think that inflation looks very plausible because of its very clear empirical successes. Uh, it predicts many properties that we see of the mass distribution of the universe and of the cosmic microwave background. Um, and that does not necessarily involve eternal inflation. Uh, but some of us theorists who like to think beyond what we can directly observe, and this includes certainly Alex Malinkin, Andre Linde, and me, and um, I'm sure I'm leaving out a number of important people. Uh, but there's certainly a, a group of us uh, who like to think about what inflation would predict beyond uh, what we directly observe. And the point is that almost any inflationary model has the property that it produces not just one Big Bang, but ultimately an infinite number of them at an exponentially increasing rate. And, the, and that's what we call eternal inflation. Uh, it's eternal only into the future. We don't think it's eternal into the past. But the way it works is that inflation sets up a repulsive gravity material, which drives an exponential expansion of that region. Uh, the material reproduces itself as the region expands. And this is basic physics. Nobody really argues that this, whether this does or does not obey the correct equations of motion. People argue about whether or not it happened, but uh, everybody agrees that this is solid physics as we understand it. Um, and then what happens is this material, this repulsive gravity material is fundamentally unstable. Uh, so it decays and produces ordinary matter and Big Bang universes. But it happens locally, not globally. It doesn't decay all at once. And uh, as these pocket universes form, they expand like some of Roger's uh, rays uh, at pretty much the speed of light once they form. You would think that they would then fill up the space. But meanwhile, the space between these bubble universes is exponentially expanding due to the inflation. So in fact, it never fills the space. The space is never filled beyond a certain tiny fraction, really. And that means that these pocket universes will go on forming forever. And each pocket universe, by the way, resembles an open universe as seen from the inside. An open universe is a universe whose uh, spatial slices, whose space at a given time is literally infinite, goes on forever. This can happen even if you start out in a finite volume. It's a very peculiar situation where one is essentially trading an infinity of time in the future with an infinity of space. So what you might have previously called evolution in time becomes evolution in space. Now, it's often combined with anthropic considerations. Uh, each time a new universe forms, if there's more than one possible type of vacuum, and string theory, for example, predicts that there is, other theories do as well, actually, but uh, string theory is the one that produces the largest number of possible vacuum, as far as I know. Each time a new universe forms, it can essentially choose what kind of vacuum is going to be inside it as a random choice, which means that these pocket universes can be rather different from each other. And that leads to the possibility 
that maybe most of them don't contain life at all and can't, and that life forms only in those pocket universes uh, where it can form. And this gives an underpinning to anthropic arguments that maybe the laws of physics that we see are what they are, mainly because that's what's needed for life to exist in the first place. To me, the cosmological constant is, 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 was a touchstone. It's what first convinced me that anthropic arguments might not be crazy. Most of our theories, quantum field theory, string theory, really all the definite theories that we have, uh, allow for an arbitrary value of the cosmological constant, uh, with string theory preferring the value of order of the Planck scale, which is vastly larger than anything that we observe. And, and furthermore, uh, the cosmological constant, at least if we're talking about variations of it of the order of the Planck scale, is hugely relevant to life. Uh, if the cosmological constant were some fraction of the Planck scale instead of the tiny value that we actually observe, uh, the universe would disappear in 10 to the minus 42 seconds. I tend to think it's the, 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 there are other reasons why the constants are, are appropriate for life to exist. But I agree that the cosmological constant, or numbers of the order of 10 to the 60, I guess what you've got there, is a very big number. And why, where on earth does it come from? I like to think that there is some mathematical reason for it. If we have to explain it by mathematical means, saying that that's the only possible value, that would be one thing. And Roger would like that to be the case. I would like that to be the case too, except I, I think it probably isn't. But and the idea of a multiverse does offer an alternative, which I think is a very real alternative in the sense that it's perfectly logically consistent. Furthermore, the same models of inflation, if one takes those seriously, which I, of course, do, the same models of inflation, which allow us to calculate uh, all the properties of the cosmic microwave background, um, almost all of those also predict that if you take those models seriously, it will produce a multiverse, and not just a single big bang. So the properties of the multiverse become entangled theory-wise, theories that we build to simply describe what we directly see. When you think about the mathematics, you really have to think about it in this platonic way. The mathematics has its own world. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not that you're creating it. You can say this is a feeling that one has, but it's more, I think, strong. You see, this is one of the worlds, the world, yeah. the platonic world which, of mathematics, which I sort of draw as this sphere at the top mm -hmm. of the picture. And then a little bit of that world, and it's only a very tiny bit, um, productive, magical, particularly magical part of that world, which seems to be, and I have it sort of projecting out to the physical world, the laws that we see being extraordinarily precise. But then the more we learn about physics, it's governed by equations and geometrical ideas and things, and we reduce them to mathematics. And in that mathematics, we can gain enormous precision in the way we describe and understand the way the physical world operates. Now this is a, in some sense, the view we have, and this is the view I have, is that this small part of the mathematical world encompasses, in a certain sense, the whole of the physical world. You might say, well, what is a, what is a rock? Well, this rock is made of mo molecules and things like that. And what are the molecules made of? Well, they're made of atoms. What are the atoms made of? Well, they're made of fundamental particles, electrons, and but then you say, what is an electron? Well, the best you can do is it's a solution of the Dirac equation. Yeah. You say, well, that's a pretty abstract notion. <laughs> and you kind of have to resort to mathematics when you mm -hmm. try to probe uh, reality at mm -hmm. its deepest levels. And then there's the next question, you see, which is my third world, which is the world of conscious experience.